Okay, let's get started. My name is Lydia Brinkley. Thank you everybody for joining us today for the Stroud Riparian Buffer Training. Sorry we can't be in person, but I think we're getting a little bit of a different audience now that we're providing this um, half training online. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Matt Earhart, who will be going over our first presentation of the day to start us off with stream ecology and the role of trees in stream health. For those of you who have not met Matt and don't know him, he's the Director of Watershed Restoration at the Stroud Water Research Center. In January 2013, Stroud launched their new Watershed Restoration Program. There, Matt focused on building and managing a restoration program, integrating current science and technology into restoration, and demonstrating how to maximize ecological and water quality outcomes while serving the needs of farms and communities. He further leverages federal and state resources, which we all know that we do on a daily basis, for how to improve public programs and public spending on conservation work. Prior to Stroud, Matt worked and served as the executive director for the Pennsylvania office of the Chesapeake Bay Foundation for over 18 years. He has graduate and undergraduate degrees, both from Pennsylvania State University. So without further ado, take it away, Matt, for stream ecology. Thank you, Lydia. Um, so um, I guess <clears throat> first, just to say thanks. Thanks for having us. Um, Dave Wise, Lynn Barber, and I are, are really happy um, to have this opportunity to share some of the information and, and work we do with you. Um, I, we certainly had hoped to be there in person, and, and maybe in the future we can um, figure out how to how to do a more thorough discussion in person. Um, and then we look forward to that. Uh, so, just to kick us off, I wanted to talk uh, a little bit about uh, the how streams work and and why these forests and forest buffers are so important to that function. Um, and and this has been part of uh, Stroud's legacy. Stroud has been around for, I think it's 53 years now. Uh, we were, we're, uh, were founded as a research institution. Uh, so we were founded in 1967, specifically to look at streams and, and freshwater ecosystems. And, and the context was, you know, that was, that was the time in our past when uh, point sources were discharging sort of in an un unregulated fashion. Uh, you know, the, the Cuyahoga River was literally on fire. Um, rivers changed color depending on what what color paint might be manufacturing some days up in the Hudson, for example. Um, so it, it was a very different time. And folks at the Pennsylvania Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia were being asked to help uh, 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 help solve and, re and address those issues, and they they fairly quickly recognized that the biggest impediment they faced was that they really had a very limited understanding of how healthy ecosystems worked, and so they didn't they didn't know how to set targets or or set goals or efforts to improve things, um, and that was that was the inception of Stroud. Um, our, our mission has been focused on understanding freshwater stream ecosystems for that entire 53 years. We have a staff of a little over 50 people full time. Those ranks swell pretty significantly with interns and postdocs over the summer. Um, and Stroud has a, a education center um, that, that works primarily with uh with middle and high school students and then as lydia mentioned we started a restoration program at stroud in in 2013. um so that's streams has been what stroud is about since the since the beginning um so to to transition into um the forest buffer discussion a little bit this this is the graphic. I'm sure many of you have seen it. Um, it sort of it demonstrates how we viewed buffers and streams in the past. That the 
the forest buffer as a filter. And uh, basically the, the understanding of water passing through that filtration zone, and primarily that's the, the organic matter and the microbial community up near the surface um, and, and the buffer being able to filter out the things that we don't want to get into our water, whether that's nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, sediments, um, basically all the things we don't want there, including the things that come out of the back end of the cow, um, the nutrients, the solids, uh, the things we don't like to talk so much about or don't think about that we can't see. The sporidium, for example, buffers can be very effective at, at, at keeping pathogens out of our waterways. Um, turns out they're also fairly effective because of that organic layer, leaf litter layer in the, in the buffer at trapping other things that we don't want to get into our water. Uh, organic chemicals like herbicides, pesticides are, are typically bound there and then the microbial community can get a chance to start eating them. Um, there's a lot of research on the effectiveness of buffers in this in this filtering capacity. And we know wider buffers do better. We know forested buffers are, are more effective than grass buffers. A um, lot, lot of body research on a lot of the details over, over time um, has sort of thrust the filtration values of forest buffers you know, in, into the restoration realm is something we focus on quite a bit. Um, thinking about buffers simply as a filter, though, also raises some important questions that I think we're just now really wrestling with. Um, how do we, buffers, if we're thinking of it in that filtering context, you know, how do we think about flow paths? And is it relatively more important to have better buffers in the areas of flow pads? Um, and perhaps conversely, what if those flow pads have concentrated flows? Does that marginalize the buffer's effectiveness in some ways? Um, and, and maybe the biggest question, uh, particularly in an ag context, is if, if we can do a better job managing our uplands, how important is the buffer? If we are maximizing soil health considerations and minimizing runoff in any context, um, what's, what's the relative value of buffer in that context? Um, so Lydia is telling me I'm breaking up a little bit. Uh, is it, Lydia, should I try to call in on the phone or is, is it acceptable? Yeah, yeah. Let's. Uh, I would call in on your phone. That would probably be best. Okay. Um, let me try to do that. Sorry for the. Okay. Thank you. It's okay. Let's just take a two-minute break. It'll just take a second.
Okay, can you hear me now, Lydia? Yes, and it sounds much better. Okay, great, great. Um, yep. Okay, so uh, moving on. Um, so I think what we want to do for the purpose of, of this presentation is sort of recognize that those filtering capacities that we've always um, value, placed value on from a forest buffer are there, and then uh, dive into some other things that we tend not to think about or focus on, um, and we'll talk about why, but um, sort of the, the rest of the story, if you will, um, maybe a, a, what's now an obscure reference to Paul Harvey, who's no, no longer on the radio. Um, so I, I will jump in and um, so these are these are the outcomes or the takeaways and I, I want to give them to you up front so you can think about them a little bit as we as we go through a discussion of why why this is the case. Um, so forested streams process and remove significantly more nitrogen pollution. Uh, they have increased biological activity compared to uh, a healthy meadow stream system. Uh, they they also they have more bottom area, so they are on average wider for the same for the same flow than a non forested stream. Uh, the biofilm is is the term we give to the the slick coating that coats the rocks in the bottom of a stream ecosystem, and stream ecosystem function really takes place on the bottom as opposed to in the water column. With, which would uh, be what you would see in a lake or an ocean. Um, so the, the work is actually going on on the bottom. So the more bottom, the more work, and that biofilm is made up of microbes, algae, fungus that, that do a lot of work for us. Um, forested streams have more of the preferred food sources for the critters in the stream and, and cooler temperatures through the summer, which is really important for a lot of our the components of our ecosystem. Um, so our initial work on this was done, um, the paper was published in the early 2000s, the work was done in the 90s. Um, we Researchers at Stroud basically looked at a series of sections of stream, adjoining sections that had forested and non-forested. And it's important to note that the the non-forested streams were, um, they weren't degraded by heavy livestock use. They were either uh, healthy pasture situations or meadow situations. Um, this, it's also sort of interesting to think about the timing. So this was, this was pre um, discussion about buffers at a policy level. Nobody was talking about buffers when this was done. And this was basic sort of, intellectual curiosity about how streams worked and how streams with trees were different from streams that didn't have trees and you know the the non-forested portions weren't really viewed as you know bad or problematic at that point um, it, it was an exercise in in sort of pure science um, it led to this paper uh, which if anybody's interested in, I think you can get from our, our website or one of one of the three of us can would be happy to share it. Uh, there's a lot of similar research done in other places. Um, probably notably New Zealand has done a significant amount of research and, and then it's sort of gained steam since that, I guess. Um, so let's dive into how, how they work and, and maybe starting at the bottom of the food chain or the food web, um, where does the energy that drives the system come from? And if we think about the energy that drives most of our ecosystems, a, a forest or a cornfield or a pasture, um, it's generally solar in nature. The, the sunlight is, is what makes that whole ecosystem work. Um, and that's um, not the case for some interesting reasons in a stream. Now we do 
We can grow, use sunlight to grow algae. If you see a, a non-forested stream, you might see a lot of this kind of filamentous algae. Um, that's typically not a good thing for a stream. And in fact, if we have a, a critter like this mayfly or, or many others, they will wander around all that filamentous algae for days and days, and then they'll die of starvation because they can't, they can't consume it. Um, in a forested system, we see diatoms uh, as, as the sort of the plant food base in that stream. Um, so about 90% of the light energy from the sun gets filtered out by the forest and, and used by the trees. Um, so these, these diatoms prefer that low light setting. They're the preferred food for a whole class of organisms called scrapers in our, in our stream ecosystem. Um, but those diatoms are a relatively small, less than 10% of the, of the food energy that goes into a stream and makes that ecosystem work. So where's the rest of it come from? Well, a, a significant chunk does come from direct inputs to the stream from leaves and twigs and pollen, uh, branches that fall. And because streams tend to be the low spot in the landscape, they collect windblown leaves and other debris that might be, that might be moving across the forest floor. Uh, so they collect more than their fair share. Um, but all of that organic input is still only about one third of the energy in the stream system. Um, just to, to do a little diversion here, uh, to think about that, that leaf litter, uh, there's been a, a fair amount of research that shows that these leaves, once they get in the stream, they typically don't go very far. Very few leaves move more than 100 meters um, downstream, which may be a little counterintuitive, but so they block up, they tend to block up and, and are captured like that by, by rocks or large woody debris and become habitat and food. And uh, that the leaf is part of the food source. Uh, what typically happens is those leaves get coated with, with microbes, algae, bacteria, and for the larger organisms, the macroinvertebrates in the stream, uh, it's a, bit, a little bit like putting a layer of peanut butter on a piece of bread. You know, the, the bread has value, but it's really good with the peanut butter. Uh, so that's, that's when they go to work and, and attack these, these leaves. And uh, to speak a little bit about the importance and diversity in these ecosystems, uh, so if we take this one, this one critter, a crate and fly larvae, um, you can see the larvae and the adult form here. These are the, they look like oversized mosquitoes with wingspans of maybe two or three inches. Um, the larvae are eating machines. They consume about five times their weight Hey, I'm not sure what happened, Matt, but we cannot hear you. Oh, are you back on, Matt? Sorry, everybody. Of course, we were going to be plagued with technical difficulties. Let's see what the issue is. Okay, am, am I back? You're back. Okay. We we um, lost you back on the previous slide. Uh, so, do you guys have echo, or is that just me? Little, let just a little bit. I apologize. Um, so. 
I'll I'll jump back. You lost me here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so this is a crane fly, and the the larvae on the left eats about five times its weight in leaf material every day. Um, trying to figure out why I have so much. Yep, Matt, I'll just Reload. mute everybody. It seems as though maybe somebody isn't muted, so I'll mute everybody and unmute you. All right, Matt, can you talk? All right, Matt, can we hear you? Hey, am I back? I can hear you now, but I can still hear somebody else's audio. Can everyone please just make sure that you're muted? Um, okay. So the the crane fly um, eats a lot of leaves, um, and if we look at what the crane fly likes to eat, if you put them in a pan, they will eat all the sugar maples. Then all the red maples, <clears throat> excuse me, all the river birch, and so forth down the list. If you put them in pans with only one species of leaves and look at how they grow best, what um, you see, they'll they'll grow best on sugar maple. They'll grow slightly slower on red maple, and so on down the list. So what you get is this interesting list where they know what works best for them and lots of different aquatic macrovertebrates have similar lists but in all different orders and it speaks to the importance of the diversity of the system that the um, that that diversity of, of food sources is there to support the, the ecosystem that we want to function for us you take away some of those food sources and you start to lose pieces of the ecosystem that, that contribute to the overall health. Um, so, so jumping back to that question of the energy, most of the, the, the energy in the stream systems comes from dissolved organic carbon. We, we call that watershed tea and basically just like the tea in a tea bag, water that infiltrates and percolates through forest soils comes out into the stream um, with with that dilute mixture of carbohydrates and proteins and amino acids and other other components that in particular the microbial community uses for food. So about two thirds of a stream's overall energy comes from this material that's being leached through the forests alongside the stream and into the stream channel um, that, that fuels that the bio the, um, the biofilm and that microbial layer a lot of the nitrogen processes a lot of the organic compounds that are in a stream the dissolved organic material the DOM the and particularly the FPOM, the fine particulate organic material, is really at the center of the food web in the stream. Uh, so, so these forested streams, they have 
more of the foods that that the organisms in the stream need, um, and and they create this biofilm of don't of stream habitat that's really critical. The forested streams also have those those reduced light levels, which the diatoms prefer. It's another critical food source in the stream, and interestingly, they have preferred temperatures, not just cooler in summer, which makes sense because of the leaf cover, but they're warmer in the winter, and that's because on average, those forested streams that are wider, um, they can absorb more sunlight in the winter and keep those temperatures up a little bit during the cool time of the year to help optimize the biological activity. Um, so just to think a little more about this, um, that, that temperature issue is really important for all of the stream organisms. And if we think about this mayfly in particular, um, and we look at how it grows in different temperatures. Uh, so we have this temperature, we can, or we can see this mayfly's growth rate at, at 10 degrees Celsius, and 15 degrees Celsius, and 20 degrees Celsius. Um, at, at about 21 degrees Celsius or 70 degrees Fahrenheit, they all die. Um, you think about, well, what? What kind of an evolutionary mechanism is that, that you, you do better and better and better, and then you reach the edge and you literally fall off. There's no, there's no down leg on the, on the growth curve. Um, and, and the reason that they have this odd, that for, for millennia, they didn't see higher temperatures. Uh, our streams were forested, particularly all of our small streams were canopy covered with, you know, minor and temporal impacts from forest fires and beaver dams and things like that. But in, 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 in total, you know, they were mostly forested, so they never saw those temperatures. Um, if you think about what that means for the stream, you start to hit those higher temperatures and you lose whole classes of organisms very quickly. And that, that upsets the overall food web in the stream. Um, particularly this bottom area. And the losses aren't just limited to organisms like fish and macroinvertebrate with higher temperature. The, the algae and the fungus those other microbial pieces of the stream community are also impacted. Um, so jumping back to the width issue um, that we mentioned earlier, this is a stream, a farm in Chester County. Um, this, this is when you, you can jump across, a um, few feet across, um, fairly deep, going through a pasture. If, if I turn around, and face upstream into the forested section, you see this. Um, so this stream is probably three to four times as wide in the forest. Um, it's not, it's, it's shallower overall, but it's not uniformly shallower. So there's a lot of habitat diversity, deep pools, shallow ripple runs, um, a much more diverse ecosystem, much more bottom area for that biofilm, which is processing nitrogen, processing phosphorus, capturing particulates and organic compounds. Um, a much more diverse community. Um, and so, so some of this extra work we're getting out of forest and streams is just basic math. You have more surface area you get more microbial biofilm, you get more processing. Um, and this value of the ecosystem services of the streams, we know exists pretty well, very well actually, but it's, it's not uniform. 
And because it's not uniform and easily modeled, this doesn't make it into many of our pollution reduction models. Um, so the, the Chesapeake Bay model or the, the smaller models we might use for local PMDLs typically don't account for this activity. Our, our research has shown that the, the processing value of a healthy forested stream as compared, the differential compared to a healthy meadow stream is probably almost or co-equal to the, the filtering value of a buffer, but it's variable. So from a regulatory standpoint, folks tend to be very uncomfortable in terms of lumping it in. Um, so to, just to reiterate the, the basics that we gain from these forested systems, um, they're really significant in terms of our stream health, our ecological health, and the ecosystem services. Just as I finish up, one note to really keep in mind is that sometimes we focus on streams that are fisheries or you know, wild trout, um, and that's not inappropriate. But it's really important to remember that these smallest streams um, are really important and that there are more miles of smaller streams than larger streams. Uh, this document was published by American Rivers and uh, another group or two as well, but basically does a fantastic job of sort of laying out why small streams are important. And the other thing I would just wrap up with is that when we're addressing stream impairments, um, our, our models and our regulatory structures tend to be set up around phosphorus and nitrogen and sediment because those are easier to model, frankly, even if I would argue we don't do it very well all the time. Um, but we, we measure our stream health biologically. We look at macrovertebrates, we look at fish. And when you're thinking about, about biology, there's a lot of things that are important besides nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment. Temperature in particular, habitat, hydrology, and, and if we lose track of those ecosystem components as we chase reductions in, in phosphorus or nitrogen, uh, we, we will be less than successful in, in improving the ecosystems and delisting our streams. Uh, so I think with that, I will stop. Um, and if you're getting the echo, I am. You're probably glad I'm stopping. <laughs> so, uh, Thanks. Um, Lydia? Back to you, or do you want to have any questions or move to a break? I okay. Can everyone hear me now? <laughs> so Mike Lovegreen says the stream width tends to be in forest as opposed to pasture. My experience has also bore this out. Is this true, or studies demonstrated in areas that are not historic agriculture, but rather historic meadow or prairie? So, so studies pretty broadly have borne this out. Um, even even prairie streams tended to have the concentration of of cottonwoods poplar forests that, that made this the case even in the prairies. Um, you know, beavers created a lot of dams through Pennsylvania, and, and so there were always sections that were, that were changing and evolving based on the beaver dams. 
um, I, I do think it's it's probably important to note that as as the slope gets higher and as you get further downstream into bigger and bigger water, the hydrology becomes the the most important factor in the width of the channel and shaping the channel morphology. Um, so that varies. And Mike, you know this with soil, slope, um, vegetation. Um, it, it's sort of a spectrum, but the more power the water has, the more the water controls the morphology. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? All right, well, we're gonna give David about five minutes, four minutes here to get his presentation up and then we'll get started here in another couple minutes. So just hold with us and we'll try to resolve that echoing issue as well. Lydia, would you like me to dial in or try the on computer-based audio? Well, based off of what happened with Matt, I think you should probably dial in. And okay. and then also mute your computer so that you're only, I don't know if that was the issue with Matt or not, but you know, we'll just get I, just get your phone audio. I think that was my issue, Lydia. I, I could not um get to my audio controls while my powerpoint was up though so i'm not sure what happened <laughs> i think it was worse on your end than ours okay um because we're you know now i'm talking and i don't have it so dave you might want to make sure you turn off your computer audio before you get dialed in Will do. Amy, you have a question about posting the presentations and PowerPoint. Yeah, we're gonna we'll probably make a page on the USC website with all of these resources. Um, the guys from Stroud have also been sending me some publications like that they're referencing within their presentations. So we'll try to make a nice packet for everybody and put that all up on our website and that'll just take a couple days time after the whole training is complete. But Lydia, since you know one of the most fun parts of this for us is um, you know the discussion that goes on and that's you know sort of hard to manage in this format. If, if folks have questions and want to send us email or give us a call um, we can you can make sure you post our contact information too, so um, so folks can feel free to reach out. Absolutely, and it would be great if we could continue some sort of forum, even if it was for a designated amount of time. But that that would be something I'd have to explore how to do something like that. Since you guys are such a great resource, it's it's nice to be able to have this dialogue with you, even though it's difficult to do it in this platform because of our technology, um, you know, <laughs> hurdles. Yeah, my apologies again. That's, it's okay. Like I said, I think it was worse on your end because you were hearing it, you know, your computer and your phone. Okay, so hopefully everybody got there and coffee and went to the bathroom and did what they had to do. Now I'm echoing. Okay, I'll be quick. So this next session is on forested buffer installation and maintenance as David describes this to me. This is just like the Stroud's prescription for installing and maintaining buffers. So David as the watershed restoration manager for Stroud Water Research Center. Most of his work focuses on setting up programs and partnerships to provide farmers with technical and financial assistance needed to implement agriculture conservation practices while building incentives for those farmers to install forested buffers. A more recent addition to Stroud's work is on soil health, taking watershed work beyond the riparian corridor to these production areas. 
So Dave also conducts research projects to improve buffer restoration methods. Uh, so prior to 2013, David did similar work for the Chesapeake Bay Foundation for 15 years. He has degrees in natural resource management from the University of Wisconsin and Penn State's College of Agriculture. So take it away, David. All right, and Lydia, <clears throat> if you just want to confirm that your hearing is okay over the phone, I'll, we'll go on from here. Everything sounds good to me. Great, excellent. Okay, so buffer installation and maintenance all in one approach. And I, I say one approach because I think there are many approaches that can work. And one of the striking things uh, through 20 years plus of doing this work is uh, there is a lot of site-specific and contextually specific details that matter immensely. Uh, so I want to be careful about that uh, from the outset, um, that uh, you get a, a clear sense of what my context is. So we talk, we'll be talking about Stroud's typical methods. Uh, those methods may be about the shift. You'll hear more about that later today as I talk about are dabbling in, uh, more than dabbling in uh, stone mulch as an alternative to herbicide work, uh, herbicide use uh, for protecting young trees. So our context is, you know, most of our on the ground work is in southeastern Pennsylvania, Berks, Chester, and Lancaster counties, uh, primarily formerly pastured areas, a little bit of crop ground, not a lot. Uh, these areas are rife with invasives, everything from uh, Oriental bittersweet, the mile a minute to uh, Japanese hops, uh, the climbing vines are probably our worst, our worst issues. Uh, very rich soils, high fertility, um, and growing season conducive to a lot of, a, a long growing season conducive to a lot of growth. And we have issues with some of our faster growing species that they actually grow so rapidly in these conditions that they wreck themselves, that their stem girth is not able to support their canopies. So you folks in New York in particular, uh, with soils, fertility, and climate, and, and uh, growing season differences, uh, so just be advised that some of these contextual differences may matter. Uh, and I can, I can share from my direct experiences, and um, you'll have to, have to make some translation. So, most of our work that we do, uh, the, the strong majority by far, is with container seedlings, and we've settled in on these uh, as much for the length of the planting window compared to bare roots, which is quite limited, uh, as anything else. We work with contractors, we work with just a few contractors, and we need them to be available. Uh, they need a long window to get the acres done that we need to have them do. We have found that the uh, containerized seedlings uh, seem to show a better drought tolerance if we do get a really dry spring um, and they really do take off rapidly. Most of our trees are emerging from the tree shelters, five foot tall tree shelters, if not in the first season, certainly in the second season. Um, and I uh, just came back from my cabin in Sullivan County and I'm looking at tubes that just now have trees emerging that I know are eight to ten years old so it it is really different even just as far north as Sullivan County in Pennsylvania. So uh, container seedlings are more expensive, but it's still only about 20% of the project cost in the manners that we do them. We're putting in about 125 to 150 uh, tubed plants, and then we do put some shrubs in the mix as well. Um, how to get them in the ground? I think there's a long list of ways that can work from shovels to augers to dibble bars, uh, Burn Sweeney did some research early and it didn't really matter in terms of growth and survivorship. Um, we've settled in on a six inch auger on a track mounted machine. Um, and that's that's been a good formula for us. Um, most of the failures that I've experienced and I've seen others experiences are due to poor maintenance. So it's far less about planting. It's much more about planting with maintenance in mind. Um, so we're using five foot shelters um, and those tree shelters uh, are critical to helping us know where trees are, to protecting them from uh, deer browse and from buck rub, uh, protect them from herbicide use as we do our spray applications. 
we use a center hole net method pictured at the right. It makes about an inch to an inch and a half diameter hole. Pull the bird net down so that there is a small hole giving the, the tree a chance to get out of there um, Over compared to the tassel method. And unfortunately, bird nets get neglected, and uh, this can really uh, lead to a lot of twisted up tree leaders that are long-term damage. Uh, in terms of shelters, I'm not, I'm not at all convinced that the years of research we've done on tree shelters has uh, really shown that there's a holy grail in terms of which tube. Um, I'll say more about that in my later presentation today. Planting with maintenance in mind, uh, we plant very, very cr critically, we're planting on rows. Uh, we, we did a few sites at landowner request of randomized planting. Uh, if you've ever tried to mow or maintain those randomly planted tubes, it is uh, crazy. And basically, if you are planting on curving rows that parallel the stream, uh, there's very few angles that you're going to view that buffer project that's going to look like Arlington Cemetery rank on row of organized tubes. Uh, so ma mainly the planting on rows allows us to do mowing in a, in a sane fashion. Um, and the normal approach that we'll use is we'll talk to the landowner, figure out how the mowing is going to be done, and then the the spacing between the rows of trees is two to three times the mower width, whatever is convenient makes sense. And then we can adjust the spacing along the row on a given row uh, to get to the density of trees that we need want to get to. And now I'm having trouble advancing. see what we can do here. All right, here we go. Switch tools. Um, all right, the main threats that we've seen to seedlings over the years and probably in order uh, for our reality is deer, then meadow voles, then invasives, especially the climbing vines, neglected shelter maintenance, uh, and then competing vegetation. And depending where you are, and you folks certainly are, in, some of you are in bear country, uh, really be thoughtful about using a conventional plastic tree shelter, which become a host area for a lot of wasps. The bears have learned that these wasp larvae are food and that tree shelters are snack dispensers, leading to a whole entire plantings just being decimated by bear damage. Lantern fly, we don't know yet. Um, so I've heard the foresters talk about the green death and the chances of finding a live tree in a tube buried up to its neck in reed canary grass is pretty remote. Um, the brown death is a term that I'm, I, maybe I coined it, I don't know, I certainly use it. Uh, the native meadow vole is a very ecologically important animal. Uh, they also do a lot of mischief uh, to tree plantings and uh, take, a, take a pretty heavy toll, these micro beavers. Uh, this is a three-year-old project that I walked out onto a June day. And this is what the wilted trees looked like at their bottom. Uh, the voles had chewed the roots off entirely, and that's pretty disheartening. Twelve feet tall trees, three years old. So we were late to the game on this learning, um, something called clean culture used by nurseries, Christmas tree farms, orchards. <laughs> Even Bern Sweeney had published research by 2002 pointed to clean culture as uh, a central uh, tenant in getting ahead of vole damage uh, and invasives. So you're looking at a crep buffer here, and if that looks a lot like a nursery grow out facility, that's, that's convergent evolution, two, two different systems converging on the same answer to the same problem of vole damage and invasives. Um, so that, that is clean culture. More commonly in the buffer applications, we're seeing herbicide spots as the route to clean culture, um, but the, the effect is the same. You know, you mow the areas between the trees uh, and you spray around the trees and the voles uh, leave you alone. In terms of research, look at the date on this, 2002. Byrne had a published article based on four years of research that came out in 2002 that spoke to this significance of clean culture and the herbicide use. 
Uh, so here are survivorship and growth graphs for a bunch of sheltered and unsheltered seedlings combined. And I'll just point that out because if you look at herbicides showing less than 60% survivorship after four years, you have to understand that that's uh, a lot of a lot of that data. Half that data set is unsheltered seedlings that took a major whacking because of direct deer browse. So, but uh, significantly, this graph shows um, that twice a year weed whacking, which is called mowing the tree mats, didn't compare in growth nor survivorship to the use of herbicides, which has been our standard. So. Uh, I went back into the data, teased out. If I just pulled out the sheltered trees in those studies, the survivorship at four years is about 16% with no herbicide and about 90% with herbicide. I was reading off of a graph to get that number. So that's Burns data published in 2002. So the herbicide and clean culture has been our standard operating procedure for uh, the years since then. Um, and it's not just that the survivorship is what you're looking for, but that the growth rate with the herbicide is more than doubled versus no herbicide. Um, and trees in that vulnerable size class where voles can kill them and deer can browse them, um, you know, to major damage, you don't want to leave trees in that languishing in that vulnerable uh, size class. So doubling the growth rate is phenomenal for helping them get past that vulnerability. So this is. This is how we go about most of our herbicide applications, backpack sprayers. So then to run through a quick schedule for you, um, and I think Lydia can make this available if there are folks that, that need this. So if you're furiously scribbling, I don't think that's necessary. You could contact me and I can get you the information in, in PowerPoint or otherwise. So uh, we are using this is southeastern Pennsylvania uh, using the herbicide spots, and this could change if we switch over to stone mulch, which we're contemplating. Um, but our first, uh, going through the calendar year, our first tasks are in late February, early March, we get out uh, fixed uh, tubes and stakes. There's frost that happens during the winter. There's deer strike, there's wind, there's whatever. Um, and then, we, because of our invasive problems in southeastern Pennsylvania, we have been using a pre-emergence herbicide that we put a shake of a granular down each tube in that same visit that we're checking on the tubes and stakes. Um, and that has that has really uh, proven helpful. Um, maybe you don't have the invasive issues inside the tubes that we do, uh, but we've got them badly and need to do something about it. The next thing is in late April, I'm um, trying to give you some prices here uh, on some of these tasks uh, to get those three foot herbicide spots sprayed. And, you know, we'd like to get out in late April. That's where the grass for us is active. It's conveniently short that, that a crew can get through efficiently. They're not, you know, up to their chest in uh, chest high grass fighting their way through. Uh, it's, a, it's a clean and efficient job to get in there at that point of the year. While we're there, we're also removing the bird nets from many tubes if the tree is within a foot or foot and a half of the top of that tube. Uh, by May, uh, we're looking for our first mowing. Uh, we try to get landowners to do that. It's expensive. If we have to hire it to a contractor to mobilize and get out there, that's expensive. Um, later on in late May or early June, uh, we're doing a second dose of snapshot. Uh, if we have invasive problems, that stuff lasts about three months. And the first time we used it, we found out we had uh, a lot of weeds in tubes when we looked at them in August. But when we did a second generation trial, we found out, okay, if you hit it again in um, May, late May, we're weed free straight through summer. Um, again, pulling nets off of tubes if need be. And I will say uh, there is a, there's a recommendation, uh, there's commentary on the label of Snapshot that uh, that pre-emergence herbicide has some possibility of damaging deciduous trees if you apply it right at the stage of leaf out within a couple of weeks before or after leaf emergence. And so that first year, we're typically weeding by hand to avoid that as an issue, but uh, we probably could even do more applications if we're just attentive to 
where we are in the leaf out stage of the tree. Moving on the calendar, now we're into July or August, depending on the year and the site. Uh, now we've reversed the order and we'll mow first. And that mowing before we do this, the herbicide applications, that is purely an access issue. You know, these sites are now chest high, waist high in grass and blackberry and whatever else, nettles. So we mow first and then we go through, have the crew go through and do the reapplications of the herbicide spots. In a dry year, uh, in the second or third year of, of maintenance, uh, we may not need to do a second application of herbicide in a given year. Uh, it'll just depend on conditions and um, it's a judgment call. And then finally in late fall, uh, we're doing one last mowing, uh, particularly if it's a site that's prone to voles. Uh, southern aspects, uh, strong hydrologies tend to be uh, strong vole habitat and to mow the site clean going into winter just exposes the voles to a lot of uh, predation from aerial predators and everybody else. So I went and checked uh, the slides a little dated now we have four year data uh, but the three year survivorship data using this approach on sites where we were doing it had you know clear control over it knew what was happening uh, we were running 96 percent survivorship after three years it dropped to about 93 92 to 94 percent after four years so still quite strong uh, a more challenging site with both uh, wall-to-wall multiflora rose in some of the areas and a lot of reed canary grass on the remainder. Uh, we we had a, a little more challenging context. We had about 89% survivorship. And one other site, a really wet reed canary swamp, uh, we had 86% survivorship using these same uh, twice a year herbicide, two to four times per year mowing. Um, and uh, that 86 probably dropped off some because we had a, a bunch of live stakes included in that uh, sample count, and they just don't uh, have quite the same success as the rooted stock. A couple of uh, ending thoughts. Uh, we budget for about $350 per acre per year, and that is that is exclusive of mowing. So if you're going if you have to hire the mowing, if the lender is not doing the mowing, you better add another three to $450 per acre per year. Um, we have found it very useful to have a bit of a cushion for needier sites, uh, particularly with invasives. Uh, we do our maintenance for a three or four year minimum. That depends on programs and grants and everything else. We find it really valuable to have a written, signed by the landowner maintenance plan that spells out what is Stroud's role and what is the landowner's role. Uh, and that's not so much a hammer hanging over their head as it is a a route to clear communication at the outset. Um, we do have some sites that we can't mow, either too strong hydrology or topography or rock outcrops or whatever. Uh, we switch over to five to six foot diameter herbicide spots for those. Uh, we're on sites two to three times a year. I will say being on site frequently uh, gives you an early um, an early indicator when problems are cropping up. And there's not a lot of problems that are intractable if you find them early. Uh, when it's a year and a half in that somebody didn't notice that you've got, you know, major infestation of, you know, bittersweet or something else, that's when things really go off the rails. Uh, and I will say uh, a lot of site prep for particular concerns, whether it's invasives or heavy reed canary grass or whatever, a lot of those options are far easier uh, to come up with solutions for, for challenges before the trees are in the way of the ground. So just it may be to your advantage to delay planting and deal with the challenges uh, before you stick them in the ground. So, uh, so that is my contact information and I'll welcome folks to reach out to me uh, should you see a need. Thank you, David. I just have a quick question in relation to the bull activity, and then I think we should just move into Lamont's session on structured question and answer, because I think we have a lot of questions that will apply to his session. But do you notice if bull activity will drop off at some point, or is there some diameter of 
route that they no longer have interest in? Are they strictly, you know, small root eaters? Or what is your take on voles and length of maintenance for voles? Yeah, and I don't think I have a, an answer based in science on that, Lydia. My my experience has been um, that they they will continue to do damage, and this is coming from orchardists and, and nurserymen. Um, they'll continue to do damage, and it really becomes a question of is the damage they do something the tree can tolerate? And I, <laughs> I was I was crestfallen when an orchardist told me. Uh, yeah, voles can kill trees up to about five inches in diameter. It's like, you've got to be kidding me. Uh, so uh, they're they're a challenge. Uh, they're ecologically really important, but, man, for reforestation in these riparian areas, they are a besetting challenge for sure. Uh, so I don't know that they go away ever. I don't know that their damage to stems and roots goes away ever. I think it becomes far more of an issue of what can trees tolerate based on size. Okay, that's kind of what I thought your answer was going to be. All right, so let's just move right on, and I'm hoping folks will chime in with questions at this point because we're going to move on to our structured question and answer with Lamont Garber. Quickly to introduce Lamont, he's the Watershed Restoration Coordinator for Stroud Water Research Center. He works with landowners, producers, and conservation organizations to advance soil health, stream health, and water quality in Pennsylvania and the wider region. He brings 30 plus years of experience in agriculture and natural habitat restoration to projects in the Chesapeake, Delaware, and Ohio rivers. Prior to joining Stroud in 2014, Lamont held positions at the Chesapeake Bay Foundation and the Pennsylvania Association for Sustainable Agriculture. He helped develop Pennsylvania's REAP state tax credit program and the Commonwealth Nutrient Management Program. He is vice president of the Keystone chapter of the Soil and Water Conservation Society and works closely with the Pennsylvania No-Till Alliance in cover crop coaching. He has degrees from Penn State University, Gaston College and Nairobi University, and he currently resides in Lancaster. Lama, I'm going to make you the presenter just in case you have something you want to show. Um, but I think that, first of all, we want to start off talking about landowner priorities with pollinators. And our first question was um, related to our experience with herbicide and maintenance applications as it relates to beehive colonies. Good question, Mark. Yes, uh, great question, Mark. Hello, everyone. And Lydia, are you hearing me clearly? Yep, I hear you fine. Okay. Um, and uh, before getting to Mark's question, I just wanted to make sure everyone saw my response to Amanda's question that she asked in the chat session. Um, and that is that uh, the question was about um, the planting layout of our buffers and should they be straight rows or can they be curving uh, parallel to the stream and um, I don't know exactly how what you're responding to Amanda but yes our our preferred approach is to um, basically lay out our rows following the stream meander if possible um, and but just as long as we're maintaining uh, rows in ways that are very clear, continuous mowing alleys, um, we really want to lay these things out to make it as easy on the whoever is going to be be mowing as possible. So straight rows in the sense that they're they're laid out for mowing ease, but but by all means they're going to look better, and and there are some other advantages if they follow that meander. Um, also, getting to Mark's question about uh, herbicides, a couple of things to, to talk about there. First, um, we are, when we're on a site uh, where herbicides are being used, we are generally talking about uh, aquatic approved versions of glyphosate. So not Roundup, but the active ingredient that's in Roundup, glyphosate. Uh, we're generally not, at least in our sites, using an additional pre-emergent herbicide. They work quite well to extend that period of time for a weed-free zone around the tree, but 
um, they're, they're tricky to do. You really have to get the rate right in order not to harm the tree itself. And so we're generally just using glyphosate. And um, so first, uh, it's important to realize that there are a lot of pesticides being used out there on the landscape, both in urban and agricultural uh, contexts that are much more toxic to bees and other insects. Uh, Neonicotinoids in particular are, are under a lot of scrutiny for their potential harm on bees. That said, because of the ubiquity of glyphosate, uh, Roundup being used out in the landscape, um, there is some new research underway looking at perhaps the more subtle effects of glyphosate on, on bees and other pollinators. Um, so I think uh, all that's to say, you know, where we, these are chemicals that we'd rather not use. Um, we are using them in a very, very small fraction of uh, on a per acre basis of what is being used, particularly out on farmers' fields. And so I think it's your question mark is actually a much bigger one for agricultural production. Um, we are we're basically spraying spray circles that are three to four feet in diameter um, at about 150 to 200 spots per acre. Uh, so there's a, actually a lot of, of area within that buffer that's not getting any spray at all. But nonetheless, a lot of people are looking for non-chemical ways to control weeds and, and perhaps even more important to prevent rodent damage, mice and bull damage to our trees that are in shelters. And that's, that's where our research, like Dave mentioned, on, um, on, vole, on gravel mulch for voles could come in. We're very, very hopeful that it proves to be effective enough that we can either eliminate or ease off some of that herbicide use. So hopefully that answered your question. Uh, toward the end of the session, Matt and Dave will be able to chime in on, on some things that maybe I don't cover as well. So with that, Lydia, how about we see if there are any others? Oh, I see Amy's got a question yep. here. If we, can't, if we can't use herbicides, what strategies can be employed from prep to planting stock size uh, for maintenance purposes? So that, um, that gets us to uh, a couple of strategies that have been used to date, some without as much effectiveness as we'd like. You know, a lot of people, I think, hope that weed mats would provide that, that weed-free treatment uh, with non-chemicals. Um, and unfortunately, I think the, both the effectiveness of, that, of, that, of those materials, those weed mats, uh, is, is, is only for a year or two. Uh, weeds really often start uh, penetrating weed seeds and their roots start penetrating those weed mats fairly quickly. But perhaps even more concerning is the uh, potential habitat that those weed mats are providing for holes and mice themselves, uh, which is contrast that to gravel, which is a much less suitable environment for those uh, rodents to live in and around and chew, chew around and so forth. Um, uh, so weed mats, I, we are not recommending weed mats generally, although there are still some firms that, that are using them and, and I guess are still having some good, good experience with those. I think that's something the rest of you can maybe chime in, chime in with later. Um, we've seen other buffers where, uh, like the Rodale Institute, for example, uh, because they are organic only, they, they were actually tilling the ground up near their trees to provide weed control in a non-chemical sense. I think we'd be really concerned about that from the standpoint of clipping young tree roots. That really needs to be a very careful operation. Um, and I, I think it's, it's also possible to get away from, from herbicides if there is <laughs> uh, almost a a lawn or golf course like management of the grasses that are growing in that buffer. We're talking about, you know, very, very uh, like biweekly mowing and, and string trimming around the, the, uh, the tree shelters. In that context, I think we'll be suppressing the grasses 
to a degree that they're having less impact on the trees. We're certainly eliminating a lot of the rodent habitat in that context, but I, I, th I think there still will be competition for water and nutrients with all that vegetation actively growing around the shelter. And, and you're talking about perhaps an order of magnitude uh, of, of like maintenance and labor needed for that kind of, of treatment. But there are some landowners who do that. Um, yes, there was just a note here about NRCS still recommending mats. I think uh, by all means, consider other people's recommendations on that. Um, but uh, I think our concern is that bowl, that bowl habitat issue under, under the weed mats. Uh, we're working with a conservation district in southeastern Pennsylvania that's doing a combination of weed mats and gravel on top of the weed mats, perhaps to try to, to discourage uh, rodents. But um, I think our, our approach is to research something to, so that we've got really good data and, and we're hoping that, that the gravel mulch is that, is that new option we can go toward. Okay. What else do we have here? Oh, a question from Amanda about mole and bowl damage in New York. Would anyone else like to chime in on that from up, up in your area? Hey, this is Lydia. Amanda, I have seen some bowl damage um, and it's really site specific, but when I see it on a site, you see it throughout a lot of the site. Um, just up in Madison County, just this past week, we saw a site that had significant damage. You know, our plants that had been growing for two and three years and are popping out of tubes, even in some cases, we were really happy to see them and then they're all dying. Why are they dying? Well, it turns out we ended up pulling them out of the ground and they were very obviously chewed. Um, so I have a question to, to follow up with maintenance. I mean, obviously, you are still getting some death. And if you have so much death that it warrants a replant on the site, do you wait until a particular year that trees maybe will stop dying? Or when would you plan a replant for a site? Or any information about that would be helpful. Yeah. OK, so I, I, I would have a two-part answer to that, Lydia. Uh, first, I think. It's, it's critical to I, try and figure out what's causing mortality. Is it, is it uh, that the, the initial trees that were planted there were actually not the best adapted to that site? Were, were they trees that prefer uh, well-drained soils that were on really wet ground? Um, do, you, do, do you have vole infestation at that point? Do you have a lot of deer pressure with inadequate uh, tree shelter protection. And just a note on the tree shelters, if you have deer in, in your area and you're gonna be using tree shelters as your way of protecting your trees, they've gotta be five feet tall. For years, we were using four foot tree shelters and we were creating deer popsicles uh, with that. They would continually just graze off the top and we'd have, we'd have misshapen trees that could never get beyond that four foot level. So by all means, use five foot tree shelters. <clears throat> um, but then to get you, once, once you've figured out why you're getting mortality, and in some cases, it's, it's really hard to suss out. Trees sometimes just die for mysterious reasons, but try to figure out what corrections you need to make with your maintenance uh, before going back with replanting. But then given that, if you're in, if you, if you figured that out, you've got a, a a plan for addressing that problem. Um, my recommendation is to try to get those replants into the rotation of your buffer as early as possible, because your best, most intensive maintenance on the site is gonna be happening likely uh, in the first three to four to five years. And let's get those replant trees back onto the site to to both catch up with that first generation of trees that were planted initially, but also give those new replants uh, the benefit of, of hopefully another year or two of herbicide mowing, uh, good shelter and stake maintenance uh, versus coming in and planting seedlings 
five or six years in, your other trees are big, uh, you're done mowing or whoever your landowner is done mowing and spraying. Uh, so that would, that would be our recommendation to, to try to get those replants um, into the site as soon as possible. Um, Amanda or Lydia, any, any follow-ups on that particular question? No, thank you. That was really, really great. Um, we have a next, another question from Troy. So when the trees come out of tubes, do we just take them off at that point? Kind of about the timing of taking the tubes off, size of the trees. He's worried about deer stripping, um, you know, the trees during yes. the growing season. Yep. Yeah, good, good point. Good question, Troy. And hi, Troy, how you doing? Um, so those tree shelters should stay on uh, as long as possible, particularly if you have deer in the area, because once those trees are up and out of the tree shelter and they are, uh, they provided sufficient height protection to prevent deer browse, now the protection they're providing uh, continuing to provide as that tree gets bigger is from buck rub, as well as continued bowl protection as long as those shelters are, are pushed down uh, under the surface of the ground. And so then, then the, the question becomes, how long can you leave those tree shelters on? And, and we're, we're quite often leaving these tree shelters on um, well beyond five years, depending on the growth of the tree. Uh, we, we obviously don't want to use a tree shelter that is not perforated. Now all the good tree shelters are perforated so that if the tree, if the tree is actually starting to need to push out beyond the diameter of that tree shelter, they're gonna be able to burst out of that tree shelter on their own. Ideally, we're getting to them first before, before they need to do it themselves, but we at least have that added protection in now with, with good tree shelters. Um, so then the, the question just becomes, do you need to start removing those tree shelters once the trees are getting big enough, three, four, maybe even five inches, where the tree shelter may actually be causing some damage to the bark through such, such uh, situations as a lot of wet leaves gathering at the base. So that's something that, that'll be a, a judgment call when you're out in the field. But then to get to your question about, um, are we, is that, is that moist, warm environment of the tree shelter actually weakening the trees? And Dave is gonna talk about this some more. Um, this is why we're particularly down in the warmer uh, parts of Pennsylvania, uh, where we're getting a lot of weak, taller trees. We're, we're starting to use um, uh, trees with aeration holes that are, are pre-cut into them so that there isn't such a greenhouse effect inside that tree shelter. And hopefully we're, we're slowing down the growth a little bit. We're getting stronger uh, trunks and, um, and so that the tree shelter can stay on longer without having any detrimental effects. So that'd be my answer to that. Okay, thanks. It looks like, you know, we have another minute. So if anybody wants to put another question up, we can take that. But if not, I'd like to just put a plug in for some resources that Lamont sent me. Because I often have a lot of questions about pollinators. Um, that is one of the big cells we have with our Trees for Trips program in New York State is the landowners are very interested in wildlife habitat and pollinators. And Lamont sent me this really great resource that shows all a lot of the different plants that we will plant and their uh, flowering season. So it kind of shows how you can plant all these different plants so that we have flowers from basically May to August or September, which is really great. All right, Mark, you put a question up about working with PVC stakes to provide a natural sway to the trees to improve trunk strength. Have you ever heard of that one, Matt? Yes, sure have. Uh, Mark, you're, you're asking some great questions. All of you are. Um, and this, this question of stakes is, is really at near the top of the list for us in terms of questions we, we're, we're also struggling with. And that's because our traditional go-to stake, which is a one-by-one, one, uh, ideally white oak stake, um, is proving to be not as reliable as 
we'd hope. We're seeing a lot of rotting going on with these oak stakes uh, out in the field, particularly on wet sites below ground. Now, is that because uh, the stakes, some of the stakes we're getting are not actually true white oak? Because most other oak species are just not gonna be uh, moisture resistant like the white oak. Or is it simply that, that some of the conditions we're planting into are just even beyond the white oak? I'm not sure. I suspect it's more a matter of we're not getting the best oak. So we are looking at some other products. Uh, we're also, uh, we have not used PVC. I've seen one farmer down here in Lancaster County that used PVC stakes. We are looking at uh, primarily fiberglass stakes like Plantra uses and, and uh, also uh, pressure treated uh, wood stakes. Um, I was out in southwestern Pennsylvania um, working with some forestry people out there and they, they're actually using aluminum conduit, uh, a metal stake that is strong enough and yet won't uh, tear someone's arm off if they cut into it with a chainsaw. So I think we're actually at, at a point of learning right now. A lot of us are. Uh, I think we're looking at alternatives for stakes. I think the, fact, the, the other issue you raise about providing some natural sway is, is also valuable. So uh, I think let's all stay in touch with this. You can be watching some of Stroud's research. Dave may be uh, talking about that in, in one of his later presentations. Thanks. Hey, Lamont. Lamont? Yes. yes. Um, Hey, this is Matt. I would I would just add to that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So we we work with some partners in New Jersey, uh, Nature Conservancy, and some local watershed groups that that do use um, PVC stakes. Um, I won't say exclusively, but but frequently for sure. Um, and their their context and, and Dave mentioned how important the context is. is they've they've got uh, bigger Bigger rivers, um, these are non-tidal rivers, but they're fairly low, um, low slope systems, but they, they come up and they flood, you know, easily three, maybe four feet above banks pool a couple times a year. And uh, they've got a lot of reed canary grass in the floodplain. And what they're, they're doing is, is scalping a circle, of maybe, maybe four to six feet then they're using bigger stocks, so they're they might be planting one caliper trees. Uh, they tube them and they and they stake them with um, with PVC pipe, and they they're having tremendous success. So their their planting densities are much lower because they're using big stock, um, but but they're really they've got canopy up above the reed canary grass right out of the gates. Uh, their system seems to be really effective. Um, at, at being able to s survive, you know, multiple flood events a year. Um, they do have sandy soil, so it's a little easier to drive those things in the ground and then have them to a depth where they can hold well. Um, but, you know, we, we've never done it, but it's working really well for them. Um, and I, I, I would just, you know, we, we know what, what's worked for us, but we're also really aware that different things are working for different people. So just to chime in here, we are, you know, at the at the end time, but if Lamont, you would like to keep going, there are some questions that have jumped up, but I, that's totally up to you. Yeah, happy to keep going. If some people want to stay on uh, while others go eat, let's let's keep going. Yeah. Okay. So Beth, Beth asked a question about shrub protection, but I think we'll touch on that later during the one o'clock section with David, so we can reserve that question. But then Danielle asks about bird nets and their actual necessity. And we see, you know, a lot of harm to tree leaders. I know you guys recommend that, you know, half dollar size hole, but while that may have been what was installed, that's not always, you know, after some wind or whatever, sometimes they creep up. Just kind of your take on bird nets would be really helpful. Yeah, so I'll I'll get started, and and Dave, just because I've been talking a lot, I'll I'll let you chime in if you're there and and want to say some other things on any of the topics we've discussed. But Danielle, um, unfortunately, we really need the bird nets. Um, 
we had, uh, and I'll just, just give you an anecdote here. Uh, I was on uh, an Amish buffer, um, a buffer on an Amish farm. It was relatively young. This was probably five years ago. Um, I went through his entire buffer checking for nets, primarily because I was concerned about the leaders getting tied up in them. And uh, I found one tree shelter that did not have a net. And in that tree shelter, I found two dead bluebirds. Um, those bluebirds that are nesting cavity birds managed to find the only tree shelter in that entire planting that they weren't prevented from getting into. Um, that, that's just the most uh, glaring example, but I continue to find uh, bluebirds um, and other species, but primarily bluebirds in that are dead in the bottom of tree shelters that aren't adequately protected. And so that's, that's why we're really trying to get away from the tassel method, which almost certainly is going to tangle the tree leader if the landowner doesn't get it off. And uh, fortunately, it seems like that, that whole method that Dave showed really does prevent the 99% of the birds from, from venturing into the, uh, the tree shelter. So Dave, did you, did you have anything you wanted to say on any of these issues we've been talking about so far? Uh, no, not in particular. One thing on the, the tube, tube removal, I will say we've got some, uh, I would call it a hacked off science. We're, we're doing some disciplined ob anecdotal observations on about a thousand trees um, with leaving the tubes on taking them off when the tube when the tree gets to be like three inches in diameter at the top of the tube and then the third approach is taking a case knife and splitting the tube top to bottom when the tree is about three inches in diameter but leaving it in place to deter buck rub so um we'll we'll see you know a few more years till we have uh till things have run their course with trees bursting out on their own to see you know whether there's really any any adequate basis in in that sort of trial to to, to recommend one approach over another. Yeah, I did. Uh, I did bring up a slide here that I think is a, is a good over. It, well, this this represents kind of how uh, we're approaching some of these wildlife and pollinator issues. Um, I'll, I'll say right out of the outset here, our, our work uh, probably errs on the side of focusing on those first four years of young tree establishment. We're kind of laser focused, uh, perhaps to a fault, on getting, getting these buffers to thrive, getting the plants, the trees and the shrubs that are initially planted to thrive and to grow and to survive. And so that, that may mean that we, we, we have not looked as much as we should have to some of the later years of these buffers. And in fact, one thing that, that uh, the three of us have been discussing is the need for us to get out to some of the older buffers that are doing quite well and see how the stream is responding to this new environment uh, of, of a healthy forest, or at least a healthy buffer. <laughs> uh, the healthy forest question might might take someone to come along with us, perhaps a forest ecologist who can, will be looking at the stream for changes. Uh, the forest ecologist perhaps could be seeing, okay, what is going on in this artificially planted uh, small forest? Uh, is it performing well? Is it providing the benefits that, that the diversity of benefits we need? Are, so, are there some things we could be doing differently with buffer design? that could perhaps enhance the, the quality, the, the value of these buffers. I just wanted to give you here with this slide um, some, some thoughts about what we can do uh, with buffer design and maintenance to really enhance, hopefully enhance the pollinator and wildlife value of these systems. And first and foremost is to try to get as diverse a planting of trees and shrubs as possible. Um, which is good for a variety of reasons. I won't go into them. I think you all know uh, the, the value of diversity. 
And, and sometimes the challenge uh, on smaller buffer sites is simply being able to order in bulk and get enough diversity in your plantings. I think it'll take some creativity there. Obviously, oaks uh, are, are perhaps the most valuable family of species of trees that are, that are in our buffers, for both for mast, but also what we're learning in terms of how insects and caterpillars and all the things that eat those animals re rely so much on oaks. Um, or at least they're, they're a leading family of, of tree for those values. So that means pit, a lot of pin oaks and swamp white oaks because of the wet ground we're planting into. Um, I will show you a picture though of, of some white oaks that are doing quite well on, on a wet site. Um, can, can we integrate uh, certain trees that we know are better for pollinators? And they may not be as highly valued by landowners, but let's explain the value and the need for pollinators and try to rotate some of these trees into our buffers. The honey and black locust, basswood, willows, tulip poplars, maple, um, and, and make sure we're getting some of those kinds of trees into the mix. Uh, we're, we're planting shrubs typically while we're planting trees, and yet shrubs, because of their different uh, form and habit, um, are not quite often fitting into the tree shelter maintenance that our program is set up for. So we've got to figure out how to, by all means, keep, get our trees to survive and thrive, but at the same time, make sure that we're not abandoning the shrubs to deer and the green death of, of grasses. So uh, because if we can get our shrubs to, to survive, uh, we're, we're enriching the pollinator value of that buffer right out of the gate because a lot of these shrubs have terrific flowering uh, characteristics that often uh, provide habitat and nectar for, other, for a diversity of native bees and, and Lepidoptera. Uh, finally, wider is better. Wider buffers are better, obviously, for the streams, but they're going to be better for wildlife as well. So let's really try to, to find ways to, to get wider buffers onto these farms, even when we have skeptical landowners. We've got to figure out ways to try to get wider. 35 feet is our minimum, but that's a bare minimum for what the stream needs and, and certainly for wildlife. Uh, there's some very interesting research on how nesting is suffers, nesting success of birds suffers when, when a buffer is so narrow that it doesn't provide enough cover for predators. Um, finally, the more that we can have connected buffers along a particular stream segment, or hopefully an entire watershed, um, the more valuable that that buffer along with its neighboring buffers is gonna be. So uh, those are just some ideas uh, to try to address some of these other uh, wildlife and pollinator values beyond the uh, water quality and stream health benefits we're getting. Sorry, that was pretty long-winded. <laughs> Are there other questions out there? Well, Ma, Amy asks about climate change and species selection and maintenance. Do you have thoughts or resources that you use to address that? Um, other than to say that the best thing we can do on these sites uh, for climate change is to get really, really good tree survival. Um, and, and if we could, if we can perhaps establish longer term contracts, perhaps, perhaps even permanent easements on these trees so that we know they're going to be in place not just for 15 years, but perhaps 100, that certainly is going to help on the climate change front. Um, Conifers, because they are growing year round, generally are more effective at sequestering carbon than deciduous trees. Um, but we're, we've got limited tools with conifers. There's only, there's only a few that are approved for, for CREP. Uh, there's only a few that seem to do well with wet feet. And so uh, that, that's a challenge. But, or perhaps we need to be looking at integrating more conifers into our buffers where we've got the soil conditions that can support them. I think that I think one of the main things we need to do related to climate change is simply uh, remind people or perhaps inform 
people, both landowners and the general public, that uh, this is, I mean, obviously tree planting is taking on greater significance globally in the face of climate change. And I think we, ne we need to be aware of and, and inform people that, that these riparian corridors that were deforested 500 years ago, 300 years ago, um, are one of our best opportunities to do uh, our own uh, native forest reforestation in North America. And that it's, it's part of uh, a broad suite of tools we've got to be using to address climate change. As, as North Americans, yeah. Hey, uh, Lamont, I, I would just add on, um, in terms of species, I, I think one way to think about it is that, you know, if, if there are species where you're at their northern fringe, you know, that, that may create opportunities. You know, we don't, things uh, where we are, you know, things like sweet gum and black gum, tend to be more southern, but, you know, there are things we may want to think about more as as options, whereas for us, um, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, people might have thought about trying to push sugar maples and some of the other species where we're at the southern fringe of their range, um, you know, because they add some diversity and they would be nice to have around, but, you know, pushing things where you're on the southern end of their range right now is probably, you know, not not a great choice in the long term. So I, I think just thinking about where you are in the range of the species you plant may may lead you, you know, to, to prioritize some over others. Yeah. Thank you, Matt, <laughs> for more accurately reading Amy's question. I misunderstood it. Yeah, and Matt, I would ask a question. Do we know whether the winter, you know, the the average winter minimums tend to be rising, but we get a couple of these cold, really cold polar vortices. You know, if we start planting stuff that's at the, you know, limits of its hardiness, is there any clarity whether we're not just seeing wilder swings, period, and could actually lose stuff that should be, you know, if 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 the hardiness zones really are shifting northward, um, you know, maybe we're still going to lose them because we get these, you know, a week or two of really bitter minimums. I'm I'm just curious whether we know what winter minimums are doing. Yeah, I, I think those those are good questions, and that's why I, I I think well, I've heard people speak on both sides of that. Um, I I would. You know, I wouldn't urge us to put, you know, bald cypress up in northern Pennsylvania, but I, I do think if you think about the things where you're, they're already here, but you're sort of on the northern fringe, those may make good sense um, to the extent that they're appropriate. Um, I, I do think, I do think trying to push species where you may be on the southern fringe of their range is is going to be more and more challenging because of hotter summers and um, that maybe one of the biggest impacts of, of the shift in climate that we see is is the, the the expansion of the vines territory and greater problems with invasives. Thank you. Okay, so we have some other climate change resources that we can share, Amy and others, once we kind of get all of our resources together. Um, it's something that we've used because we apply for some funding here in New York State for climate resilient farming, and sometimes we get higher points if we include a climate resilient planting plan. So I can share some of those resources with you and everyone else. So it looks like that's the end of our questions. So I would just like to say thank you guys very much for participating via chat and thank you to our speakers for great presentations and really, um, really great answers. We really appreciate this guidance. Um, so again, just at one o'clock, log back on, same story, just a few minutes beforehand, get on so we can go over some research methods and address some of the questions that came up in terms of protecting shrubs 
and talk a little bit more about shelter types. And I'm betting that David will probably have some time after that to field questions as well. Um, so thank you all. And if you guys are okay with it, I, I guess we're done for this morning session. Great. Thanks, okay. Lydia. Thanks, everybody. Yep. Okay. Talk to everybody around one o'clock.